Do some practice examples. Go. This was all on smart side. By the way, sorry, the other one projector hopefully will be fixed soon. A uh, tech person is coming over to take a look at it. But we'll do what we can for the time being. Okay, this is a pretty typical question that you can see on an exam. You can see how this works. Uh, this is a pretty standard way of rewriting it out. In this case, barium chloride. Write that out, barium chloride. BaCl2, because barium is two, plus two, or is minus two, is mixed with potassium chromate, K2CrO4. So potassium is plus one, chromate is minus two, so I need two potassiums. That goes to, uh, now this is a double replacement, so the barium goes with the chromate. Barium chromate, barium is plus two, chromate is minus two. And uh, let's see what else we have, potassium chloride. One potassium, one chloride, potassium plus one, chloride minus one. Okay, so that's the first step. Uh, we can also check on balancing this thing. And it looks like all I would need is a two in front of potassium chloride. Okay, to get to the net ionic equation and even to write out the reaction, I really should use the solubility rules. So I'll try to do it this way. Hopefully we can pretty much see them. Okay, uh, according to bullet two, anything with a chloride uh, is aqueous. And so that would be barium chloride and potassium chloride. Those are both going to be aqueous. According to bullet one, anything with a potassium is aqueous. And so that would be potassium chloride. Okay, and then according to bullet five, the barium chlor uh, chromate is actually a solid. So I'm going to use that information to fill in the state symbols here. So let's do that. We've got aqueous, aqueous, uh, solid, aqueous. Okay, and that's really my step two of writing that out of equations, is putting in the state symbols. Uh, by the way, so this is a double replacement. Whenever you have a double replacement that forms a solid from aqueous compounds, we have a specific name for that. It's called a precipitation reaction. So specifically, this is a type of double replacement called precipitation. It's really just because this solid right here. Okay. Uh, now we want to write the net ionic equation. All uh, in order to do that, we get to the third step where we separate out strong electrolytes. So is anything in that reaction not a strong electrolyte? The barium chromate, because it's a solid. Everything else is an ionic aqueous. So they can all separate out into, say, for example, barium and two uh, chromate uh, chlorides, I mean, or here, two potassiums and a chromate. And over here, we've got two potassiums and two chlorides. And what you're going to notice is we've got some cancellations with the chlorides and the potassiums. They're going to disappear. And now we can write our net ionic equation down below. We're going to have a barium left over. That's aqueous. Uh, it's ionic, so it's aqueous. We're going to have a chromate left over. That's aqueous. It's an ion. And then that's going to go to a barium chromate. And that's a solid. And that's my net ionic equation. So the reaction is what's in blue up above. And then in purple, by the net ionic part, that's my net ionic. How, do I, how did I figure out that this is a solid? From the solubility rules, bullet five, this one, chromates are insoluble or solids. I have to say that again. Yes. I actually say this everything. That's insoluble a solid, yes. Uh, and it's also called precipitate. So then we're going to use those three terms to go together. Insoluble, solid, 
precipitate all go together. Okay, and likewise, soluble, mostly soluble, aqueous, and no precipitate go together. Uh, there's another question, yes. But I know very fluoride was I knew barium chloride was aqueous because halides, chloride, is aqueous. And soluble, it's no precipitate, etc. Okay, so all halides, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, hydride, etc. Okay. Oh, there's one other way I could have known that, actually, by reading the question. If something's mixed with another thing, both reactants must be aqueous. So this is just another way of saying they're both aqueous. All right, let's do the next one, see how that one goes. Strontium acetate. Strontium acetate. Strontium plus two acetate. Minus one. Uh, and then we got a lithium sulfide. Lithium plus one sulfide is a minus two, so I need two lithiums. And then uh, this goes to, let's see what else we got. Oh, it must be a double replacement, so it's going to be a, a lithium acetate. Lithium plus one acetate minus one, so one of each. And then a strontium sulfide. <coughs> strontium plus two, sulfur is minus two. Let's see if I need to balance anything. I do, I should put a two right here in front of the lithium acetate. Okay, let's look at the solubility rules. Now, I'm gonna have to move this for a moment. Okay, we got what we have. The strontium acetate. If you look at the solubility rules, what do you find out about acetates? They're all aqueous. So, strontium acetate and lithium acetate are aqueous. Okay, what do we know about sulfides? They're insoluble except Group 2 sulfide. What's a group 2 sulfide in our reaction? Strontium sulfide is a group 2 because it's in the second column. So strontium sulfide, where you might initially think it's insoluble, is actually soluble. Or How about the lithium sulfide? Is that aqueous or solid? It's aqueous because yeah, it's group one. Bullet one takes precedent because it says except above rules. So group one, lithium uh, sulfide is aqueous. So we find out that they're all aqueous. Are any of these not strong electrolytes? Are any of these not strong electrolytes? They're all aqueous uh, compounds, they're all strong electrolytes, they will all separate out in solution. What does that gonna mean? They'll all cancel. So that, uh, another way of saying that, according to the instructions, you can write NR or no reaction. And that means that if everything cancels, that's a no reaction situation. Okay? So if everything cancels, meaning everything is a strong electrolyte, that's a no reaction situation. So you can write NR or no reaction in that scenario. Why? They're all spectatorized. They don't do anything. They're all watching the Super Bowl, uh, but nobody's playing. Actually, can't say, this is a videotape, I can't say Super Bowl because that's trademarked by the NFL. They're all watching the big game. <laughs> and none are playing. Next. Chlorine gas. And I hope when you see that, you write Cl2 gas, not just Cl. Chlorine gas, because it's diatomic, is bubbled uh, through an aqueous solution. Wow, we already know what this is. Potassium bromide is aqueous, which we can get from the solubility rules also. Okay, uh, this is what kind of reaction? A single replacement, so then we're going to get KCl and what? Br2, what state by the way? Bromine is a liquid. KCl, if you look at your solubility rules, is 
one. Definitely eight ways according to bullet one. Not only is there a group one in there, but also there's a halide in there. So for either reason, it's a good. And I should balance this, and I can simply do that by putting a two in front of both potassium columns. Okay, so it's all balanced, we're all set. Now we want to find the strong electrolytes. Uh, is it yes or no, strong electrolyte? No? Yes? Yes? No. Okay? Neither of these, because they're not aqueous, these are both aqueous ionics. So, for both of those, you could write, well, there's two potassiums, there's two bromide ions, there's two potassium ions, there's two chloride ions. So, what you'll see happening is the potassiums will cancel from both sides. So, what you're going to end up getting at the end is following for the net ionic Cl2 gas plus two bromide ions, aqueous, goes to two chloride ions, aqueous, plus bromine two liquid. And that's my net ionic equation. Okay, any questions on those three? Those three. So we go on. Yeah. That's right, when you have a solid, liquid, or gaseous saying they're unchanged, meaning they're not strong electrolytes, and they stay as is in the net ion of the equation. That's right. Okay. No more questions, we're moving on from here. Oh, yes? Two BR negatives, why is this aqueous? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, two BR negatives does not equal BR2. First of all, that would be BR2 two minus. That would have two negative charges. It'd still be aqueous if that existed because it's an ion. Okay? So yeah, this does not, you should not change the chemical structure of anything going down. You just carry it down. Okay, yes. How do you know that BR2 is a liquid? Because you either were born with that knowledge or you have my reader. And you flip back to the beginning of chapter 5, uh, page 33, liquid. Got no, yeah, we're assuming the textbook, everybody's assuming you know everything in the Bottom page 33. All right, and this electrolytes, if you don't know that, that's on the page 32, previous page. Okay, last question. Here we go. Oh, okay, just put that away. She's looking at strontium acetate. Uh, acetate, yes? Bullet three, strontium sulfate, but we don't have strontium sulfate. Okay. We have strontium sulfide. Yeah, is that okay? Okay. Cool. All right, let's go to the next one. Let me add, well, we're really excited about that one. This one will be easier, I think. Experimenter has a solution of 2.1 molar. And this is on the site, HBR. Uh, 100 milliliters and a solution of 2.2 molar uh, nitrous acid, 90 milliliters. Which one's the stronger acid? What's the answer? No calculation necessary. Which one? Stronger acid is? HBR, how'd you know that? It's on that table. I didn't even ask you about the solution, first of all. I'm just asking which one's the stronger acid. Everything's random. And how's it going? Don't worry, people walk up here sometimes. So I'm just asking you which one's the stronger acid. Now, even if you consider it's a solution, HBR is such a strong acid, HNO2 is such a weak acid, it still would be a stronger solution. So it really doesn't matter. Okay? HNO2 is not the strong acid. What is the strong acid if I looks like that? HNO3 nitric acid. Well, I'm going to go to the next one. I'll just stand over here next to you. 
go ahead and push my buttons, whatever you need to do. Okay, let me go to the next button here. So I broke it. Okay, somebody broke it. I need to blame somebody. Okay, here we go. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Oh, it's not identical. Okay. Okay. All right, let's do this. This is the balancing, this is the read offs. Here we go. Let's do this craziness. All right, let's work on the charges here first. Uh, this, uh, if hydroxide is minus one, chromium must be plus three. Got it. Oxygen is minus one, chlorine must be plus five. Oxygen is minus two, chromium must be plus, I got six. Uh, is that work? Yeah. And then I'll do these one minus one. Okay, good. So, chlorine is? Juice. So the chromium is oxidized, it went up in oxidation state. Chlorine went down or reduced its oxidation state. So that's the oxidation re half reaction is this one. Okay. The reduction half reaction is as follows. Okay, let's work on one at a time and we'll make a way through this. So, step one, just pick the oxidation, balance whatever is not oxygen or hydrogen, that's chromium. There's one on each side that's done. Step two, balance the oxygen. So on the right there's four, on the left there's three. So I need a water in here to balance those oxygens. By the way, I always have these on exams, they're almost always on the final. Uh, it's a free. 10 to 15 points if you can just follow the steps and solve it. Okay, step four, about the hydrogens. There's five here, zero here. I think that does it. And then step four, about the charge. Zero on this side. What's the overall charge on the right side? Plus three, so I need three electrons to make it the same as the left side. Okay, bottom one now. The reduction half reaction. Uh, first, balance whatever is not oxygen or hydrogen, that's chlorine, there's one on each side. Step two, there's oxygen, uh, so I'm going to balance those three oxygens with three waters. Step three, I'm going to balance the hydrogen, there's six now there, so I need six H plus here. And then to balance the charge, minus one on the right, plus five on the left, I'm going to go five electrons here, and that will make Oh, I don't think quite the five. What, what would be a of five? How many do I need? How many do I need to get minus one? A six. Is that okay? These cancel, that's just minus one on each side. Okay. All right, I'm gonna add these up now. Okay, times the top one by two and bottom one by one. So that makes six electrons that must cancel in your overall reaction from these two simultaneous reactions to uh, chromium three hydroxide plus two H2O. I'm going to write all the reactants plus uh, the chlorate ion plus. 6, 8 plus, don't need to write the electrons, they're canceled, uh, plus the chromate ion, plus, and there's two of those, plus 10 H plus, plus the chloride ion, plus three waters. Okay, that's the acidic conditions answer with some simplification. Let's do simplification now. Uh, we need to cancel six H pluses to make four on the right, and two waters from each 
side to make one on the right. Okay, now, uh, I'm not done yet. I want to do the basic conditions answer because that's what was asked for. So let's solve for the basic conditions answer. I need to identify the H pluses, which are right here. There's four of them. So I'm going to add four hydroxides to each side. Be data to both sides. Okay, and then we're going to get, let's see, two chromium three hydroxide plus uh, chlorate ion uh, plus four hydroxide goes to two chromate ions plus four H plus and four OH minus make four waters plus another water is five waters plus a chloride. <coughs> and this is now the basic conditions <coughs> answer. Uh, you can try to work on the states if you wanted to. Everything that has a non-zero charge would be aqueous. <coughs> Water is a liquid. And then the chromium hydroxide, I'm not sure if that's one you can find on your solubility rule. Let me see if it's on there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, hydroxides are solids, it tells me. So sometimes you'll come across uh, items on the side that don't fit our solubility rules, but it does fit bullet four. Okay, any questions on this one? Did I miss something? Why did I add OH to both sides? Because I wanted the basic conditions answer set in the question. And I had H plus here, that means acid. So H plus means acid. I'm adding hydroxide to both sides to get rid of the acid. Now the reaction is doing that naturally. We have to manufacture this by just merely adding it. Okay? The solution's already basic, so this is happening naturally. Okay, and that gets rid of the H plus as you see there's no more on the right. Part of the steps of uh, balancing redox, which uh, is on page 38 of the reader, where you add the hydroxides to get rid of the Acidic condition. Okay, let's try one more. This one is a type of question you would, everything so far you could have seen on an upcoming exam. This is one that you slightly wouldn't be able to see. It involves a small concept uh, that I'm not going to put on the exam, but it's still redox. The half reaction method we're going to use it still holds. Uh, there will just be, there's one slight issue with this. And you'll find out momentarily if you don't know already. Okay, let's find out what's going on here. What's the oxidation state of iodine here? Zero. This is minus one in here. Okay, oxygen's minus two, hydrogen's plus one, this is plus one. What is oxidized? What's oxidized? Iodine goes up in oxidation state. What is reduced here? Iodine. It goes down in oxidation state. Oops, reduction. This special type of reaction, uh, it has the word and an example on page 39 of the reader. It's also in the textbook somewhere, uh, page 176. This is called a disproportionation reaction. Disproportionation reaction. It's a type of redox. A disproportionation. It's where the same item or the same element is oxid both oxidized and reduced at the same time. Yeah. The second iodine is a positive one. And why is that true? We know oxygen is minus two. We know hydrogen is plus one. So the net right now would be plus uh, minus one. Well, I need a plus one to make a neutral charge. That's how I got plus one for iodine. Okay, how do you solve this? Uh, well, I2, if we're gonna write the oxidation, I2 goes to HOI. Which would be, what's the name of this compound, by the way, if it's aqueous? It would be hypoiodous acid. 
I owe, I owe this x. Okay, uh, and then for the reduction down here, you'd write again i of i goes to i minus now. So i to the product, whatever is oxidized and reduced will appear in both reactions. That's totally fine. That happens whenever you have a disproportionation reaction. So iodine, again, because it's both oxidized and reduced, appears in the reactants of both reactions. Okay. Now, from this point on, this would be totally solvable, or this would be material that you can see on the exam. Uh, I'm just not specifically asking disproportionation, which would be this first step here. Okay. Uh, let's balance it. First, balance whatever's not oxygen or hydrogen. That's iodine. I need two on both sides. Second step, balance the oxygens with water. You need two, uh, one water on each side, or one water here, so it's one oxygen on each side. Step three, uh, balance the hydrogens. Uh, oh, there's two water, sorry. Yeah, because there's two oxygens here, two waters. Okay, now step three, balance the hydrogens. There's two here, there's four here, <coughs> two H plus. And the last step, step four, add electrons to balance the charge. Now for the reduction, step one, balance whatever is not oxygen or hydrogen, that's iodine. <coughs> step two, balance oxygen, there is none. Step three, balance hydrogen, there isn't any. Step four, balance the charge with electrons. <coughs> now we've got two simultaneous reactions, we're going to add them and cancel out the electrons. Lucky for us, these electrons are both the same number, so they'll easily cancel. Just for completeness, I'll say we're multiplying by one. Now, we're merely just going to add these things. Uh, we'll get, for the reactants, 2I2 plus 2H2O goes to 2HOI plus 2I minus plus 2H plus. Notice all the twos will cancel. This often happens where there will be a doubling and you'll have to divide through by two. You got I2, uh, that's what state, by the way? Solid, yeah. That's one of those things on the standard conditions chart to know. Water is a liquid. Uh, this is the hypo uh, iodous acid, aqueous. There's I minus, that has a charge, so it's aqueous. And then there's H plus, which has a charge, so it's aqueous. Okay. There's my acidic conditions answer, and I'm done. Any questions on this? Okay. Cool. Well, I think that's all the practice we have today. So where are we at? What have we got going on over here? It is, as far as lecture is concerned, exam eve. Okay. So check. Uh, next class of the exam, make sure you go to the right room. I'm going to say more about the exam in a little while at the end of the class. Uh, but I was going to say something right now. I'm just going to look it off. It's probably going to be something awesome. Okay. Uh, everything I'm going to cover that is new today. The only thing that you've seen is the disproportionation so far will be on exam two. Okay? So I don't want to give you new material on exam eight. Okay? So uh, everything new today is on exam two. Alright. We're going to start off with a little summary, which is page 40 of the reader. There's a lot of definitions of oxidation and reduction. For that reason, I just want to summarize them so you can see them all in one place. Uh, so in case you're getting multiple definitions from multiple sources, you don't get to use. Uh, I The definition I'm using is the third one. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. If, when you do a reaction, if there's more oxygen on something at the end of the reaction, that entity has just been oxidized. If there is less oxygen on that entity, it has just been reduced. Kind of a corollary that goes with that is that if there is more uh, hydrogens, it's been reduced. And if there's less hydrogens, it's been oxidized. 
Let me see if this kind of fits our example here. Notice this one. Chromium was oxidized. I didn't even have to do this calculation I did above. I could just say, oh, there's more oxygen. Oxidized. And that's it. Chlorine, less oxygen. Reduced. And that's a really simple way. Without doing any math, no numbers, you can just look at it. There's less oxygen on chlorine. That has just been reduced. So it's a really easy way to tell. It doesn't always, always work. Uh, but uh, it's an easy way to kind of take a look. You'll often use these definitions in OCHEM, the first two, uh, because in OCHEM, it's a lot harder to do the calculation sometimes of that, uh, of the oxidation state of some of the carbon atoms. Okay, I'm using the third definition. When you increase the oxidation state, you've just been oxidized. When you reduce or decrease the oxidation state, you've just been reduced. Okay. There's, but the most common one that you probably get in high school is the fourth one, or in tutoring sessions, where if you lose electrons, it's oxidation. If you gain electrons, it's reduction. Or they'll say Leo Gur or oil rig is a mnemonic. Who, who's learned the fourth one before? Okay. I don't use that, and the reason is, and you can if you like it, but there's an additional math step. That, and who wants to do more math? This is chemistry, right? We're going to maximize our chemistry. Here's why. Uh, if I just if I did this previously, oh no, I put away that practice problem. Let me see if I can find it again. Here it is. If I did this previously, so I saw uh, chromium went from three to six. Did it gain? Now I have to, instead of just saying oh it's oxidized because it went up, I have to say did it just gain or lose electrons? from three to six. It must have lost to go up positively. So then if it lost uh, electrons, it must have just been oxidized or reduced. Oxidized. Okay, so you have to go through uh, two additional thought process steps. And that's why I don't like, I, well I guess, yeah, no, I pure just don't like it. I don't like that method. But if that works for you and you've already learned it and you're using it well, please continue to use that. Okay, the fourth one, or the fifth one, you're really going to see a lot in 2C, but you can use it now if you want to. If you see electrons in the products, that's oxidation. If you see electrons in the reactants, uh, that's reduction. And that's always going to be true. So, uh, electrons in the products, oxidation. Uh, electrons in the reactants, reduction. That's all going to happen. Okay? So, I just wanted you to see those are the five common definitions for, for how to tell if something's oxidized or reduced. Uh, and different classes will use different definitions. Okay? See these in OCAP, you see this one in 2C, you see this one in tutoring, you see this one here. So, pick your favorites. Sometimes, all of them don't necessarily work all the time. Well, specifically, the first two don't always help you. Okay. So I wanted to show that before we went to the next section, which is section six. Here we go. Agents. And this is page uh, 40 of the reader and page 177 of the textbook. Okay, there is an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent. Really, this is a definition section. An oxidizing agent is something that has just been reduced, and a reducing agent is something that has just been oxidized. If you know your English grammatical terms, being reduced is a past is the passive voice. So the active voice is your oxidizing agent. So uh, if something was reduced, it's oxidizing agent. If it was oxidized, it's called a reducing agent. You just have to get straight with those definitions. Let me show you on a past example how this works. So chromium was, ox uh, was oxidized. Thus is the reducing agent. Why do we use that term? Because chromium helps reduce chlorine. So chlorine is uh, you know, was reduced, so that makes 
chromium is a reducing agent helping reduce the chlorine. Chlorine is reduced, thus it's the oxidizing agent helping oxidize chromium. So they both work together, it's just a matter of how you use it. Alright, that was a nice section. Let's move on. Cool. Oh, and I just wanted to show you this briefly, just to remind you it's still here before we go to section 7. Remember at page 32, the beginning of chapter 5, this is our flow. This is what, what we're following. We've done the net ion equations. You should know how to do that. We've done acids and bases. There's a neutralization reaction under that to know as well. We've done redox, acid-base conditions, and now we're moving on to titrations. It's our last section. So this is always going to be the flow. You see this in the chapter of kind of the different things within the chapter that I expect you to know as far as broad categories. Okay, so we're going on to our last section, which is section seven. I believe it's the last section, uh, and this is called titrations. Uh, you have not, I believe, done a titration yet in our labs, but uh, you might have seen it or heard about it. Uh, it's where you have a burette, and you dropwise drop one solution into another solution, and the second solution is down in the flask below. That second solution has a, uh, what's called an indicator, a color changing indicator in it, such that when the reaction has come to completion, that uh, reaction turns colors, in this case pink. So this is phenolphthalein that causes the pink change color, uh, change in color. They actually <coughs> did a, a not that great job on the titration here. They went to a really hot pink color in lab. You should go to the, just immediately upon the color change, that's when the reaction is done. Okay, so they went way past, uh, I think just to, so you can see in the picture. But uh, this is a reaction where you put two together, and by measuring it with a burette, you'll know the volume delivered. And uh, you'll know exactly how much volume is delivered to cause this to occur. And it allows you to do calculations. And you're going to do more of this really in 2B, but it's introduced in 2A. There's a lot of different indicators of all different kinds. Colors the rainbow. There's natural in indicators that you can make if you look them online, I think cabbage is one that you can use cabbage to actually make an acid-base indicator. Um, but there's a color change somehow uh, with the indicator when the reaction is done. And we picked those indicators for you at this point, but if you went later on into doing research, uh, knowing some things about pH, you can pick your own indicator. Okay, so let me say a little bit more about titrations. They always look like this, this general look. A plus B goes products. Uh, the thing, if I draw, the, here's the burette. There's the burette. Here's the flask that we have at the bottom that have the indicator in it. Uh, we'll call this A and we'll call this one B. A is called the titrant. That means to deliver. So that's type of is about delivering to the one that you're analyzing. The one that you're analyzing is called the analyte. That's in the flask. That we'll call B. A is the one that is known. So usually you know the molarity of A precisely, and you're trying to find the molarity of B. That's usually what happens. So you know the molarity of A, you're trying to find the molarity of B. Uh, and you measure volume. So you're measuring volume of A, you know the molarity. For B, uh, you know either the mass or the moles, maybe you know the volume slightly, uh, and you're trying to find usually the molarity, but they can also ask you for other things like volume or mass. By the way, I see people sitting on the stairs. There's plenty of chairs up here. If you want to move now, we're going to break. You can uh, sit on the stairs unless you have some fondness for stairs. Okay, so. A uh, solving method. Let's do solving method. Uh, step one, you're going to take your given info about uh, A. Uh, A, you change that to moles of A. Step two, 
going to use a molar ratio. And you're going to, oops, molar ratio, and you're going to go to moles of B. Step three, you're going to uh, solve uh, for uh, what's asked, unit asked for of B. Okay? That could be mass, it could be molarity, it could be volume, a number of different things. So it's kind of a three step method. You're going to use a couple things potentially. Uh, you'll probably use, you might use that the molarity is moles per liter. You might use the conversion 1,000 milliliters equals 1 liter. Uh, and you're going to use the molar ratio, for sure, in the balanced reaction. Okay, a couple more things. When the color changes, When you achieve a color change, that's called either the equivalence point or the end point. <coughs> Equivalent to the end point, they have slightly different definitions you'll learn in Chem 2. Uh, it also could have other names like stoichiometric point. But what's interesting about this, at the equivalence point or at the end point, there's no limiting reactant. There's no limiting reactant at the end point. That means both reactants are used equally. Okay? So there's no nothing in excess, there's nothing limiting, they're both used equally, they're both totally gone. It's like when we did the demo uh, a couple lectures ago with the light bulb and the titration, and when the light bulb went off, at that point there was no limiting reactant. There was only products. What's the math of that? That means the moles of uh, B initially, that's in the flask at the bottom, equals the moles of A added by the burette. So you're going to use that math in order to do future calculations. Okay. Now, how does this all boil down? Let's try a practice. Twenty-five point three zero milliliters, uh, 0.277 molar HCl, was used to titrate 10 molar ammonium hydroxide. I want to know the molarity of ammonium hydroxide. Okay? Pretty standard question. Uh, if you're doing a titration example, oh, I have other extra ones. Titration one, two, three. If you're doing uh, an example, how do you know it's a titration? There's going to be a reaction. There's going to be multiple compounds of interest, pure HCl and ammonium hydroxide. And you'll either see titration or a variant thereof. Or you'll see the word standardization or a variant thereof. So titration or standardization, look for those words. And you'll notice this kind of problem. Okay, how do we tackle this one? I always write out the reaction first. HCl plus NH4OH goes to NH4Cl, this is a double replacement, plus H2O. Okay. The double replacement neutralization type reaction. Okay, and then underneath, I write down what I have and what I'm looking for. So there's uh, 25.30 milliliters, 0 0.277 molar, and then there's 10 milliliters of this one, and I want to know the molarity of this one. Everything's balanced. Again, just like normal, we just care about the reactants typically. We don't really care about the products in these types of questions. So I'm going to do change this to moles, do a molar ratio, and then find molarity. Those three steps. Change that to moles, do a molar ratio, and then find the molarity. So I'm going to run three typical steps. So let's do that. We've got 25.30 milliliters of HCl. Let's change that to liters. 
1,000 milliliters per liter. And then there's, uh, now we still need to go to moles, and I can with that 0.277 moles per liter. So now, notice what canceled milliliters is gone, liters are gone, I have moles of HCl. <coughs> Next step is my molar ratio. Molar ratio, there's one mole of ammonium hydroxide for every one mole of HCl. Notice the moles of HCl are gone. And I have moles of ammonium hydroxide. <coughs> now I'm ready to convert to what they asked for. They didn't, uh, they asked for molarity. At least in a different color. They asked for molarity, remember that's moles per liter. This is moles, I got moles. What am I going to divide this by? I gotta divide by the volume, which is, there's 10. So I'm finding that original molarity. But what's the problem if I divide by 10? Yeah, it's the wrong unit. So I've gotta convert this to liters. This turns out to be, you don't have to do it in one big monster mess like I did here. 701 molar, molar hydroxide. Okay, I'll let you chew on that for a second. And, uh, um, no, let me just say two things about it. First, uh, sometimes people want to use this equation. If you learn this in high school or whatever to do a titration problem, Garbage. Don't use that. This is for dilutions. This will not work unless all these numbers are one up here, which they don't have to be. Uh, the second thing I want to say about this, does this look vaguely familiar from some place previously? When did we learn this actually? We learned it in chapter 4 when we did titrations in chapter 4. It is identically identical. I don't know how to say it. More. This is the same thing, it's just stoichiometry, okay?